Hello, and welcome to Distant Echoes, Episode 2, New Mexico 2, The Archaic Period. Last time we talked about the Paleo-Indian Period, which covers the earliest people in the Americas and Southwest, big game hunters. We talked about how we can determine when people lived there using things like radiocarbon dating and tree ring dating, and some of the issues with these methods. We also talked about how we estimate the climate using things such as tree rings to estimate climactic conditions, pollen samples, or pack rat middens. Today we'll be covering the next two major periods of the prehistoric era of New Mexico, the Archaic and part of the early farming periods. The Archaic, lasting from 5,500 BC to 1 CE, covers the remainder of the pre-agricultural period. While my notes say the shape and style of points is far less important now compared to how it was for identifying previous periods, I'm still going to end up talking about them quite a bit during this episode. As the people are still nomadic, it is still very hard to find remains of of their life. One-handed monos stones to grind corn and other plants, and matates, the grinding basins for these stones, begin to appear during this period. In the accompanying post for this episode, some examples of manos and matates are given. Why did these grinding stones begin to appear? There's proof that people began to shift away from hunting and move towards a more vegetarian diet. The reason for this shift in diet are thought to be due to population pressure. As the population increased, it became harder to subsist mostly off of hunted game. By the end of the Cody complex, the population density has been estimated as about one person to 26 square miles. Another theory is that as the climate changed and got even hotter across parts of this period, known as the Alta Thermal, the bison that were previously hunted were pushed further north, and the overall productivity of the land decreased, forcing adaptation. Regardless, a shift to plants is a far more efficient use of land. According to David Stewart, meat loses about 90% of the calories input to it. Thus, by switching diet to a more vegetarian style, significantly more calories can be gained from the same amount of land. This does not mean that people can just settle down, nor does it mean that they can just go fully vegetarian. On the former point, plants rarely grow in large groups in the southwest. People still had to be highly mobile, traveling from grouping to grouping of these plants. Meat was also still quite important. There are certain amino acids that humans need to survive that can only be found in meat or modern supplements. Meaning the archaic period hunter-gatherers still needed to do some of the hunting part of hunter-gatherer. Starting in about 5000 BCE, major climate change occurred in a period known as the Alta Thermal. It got much hotter and drier. For instance, in the Four Corners region, it was warmer and drier than it is today. There's evidence that some of the game previously present began to move, began moving north. By 4000 BCE, it is believed that every year was harsh. By now, the bison hunted by previous peoples were believed to spend their winters grazing in Colorado and then migrated to spend the summers in Alberta. By 3000 BCE, five distinct cultures appeared. The San Diguito Pinto in Arizona, California, and Nevada, the Chiricahua Cochise in the southern southwest, the Waco Complex in southeastern New Mexico, the Coahuila Complex in Chihuahua, New Mexico, and West Texas. The most important one for this podcast was the Oshara, which ranged across the Arroyo Cuervo, San Juan Basin, Rio Grande Valley, Plains of San Agustin, South Central Colorado, and Southeastern Utah. The Oshara, who it is believed became the ancestral Puebloans, can be broken into five different phases, which I'm going to go through quickly. The first being the J, talked about in our last episode. Then came the Bajada. Bajada points have basal thinning and indentations not seen in J period points. There are no longer any Paleo-Indian hints left in the points found. They also had chopping tools, scrapers, hearths, and earth ovens. They used rock shelters for campsites. By the end of this period, the Alta Thermal had come to an end. Following the Bajada phase is the San Jose phase from about 3000 to 2500 BCE. The San Jose points show more serrations, shorter length, and smaller length to stem ratio. They had larger subsurface ovens, and monos begin to appear. Their tool sets were much more localized for their environment. By the end of this period, almost every choice rock shelter or campsite was in use. Their points can be found over half the continent. There is also a shift away from wandering as much. At about the end of this period, a more or less modern climate was achieved. Next, we have the Armijo phase, from 2500 to 1500 BC. After about 2000 BC, the Armijo rock shelter use began to drop off. It is around this time that maize and squash is currently thought to have appeared in the southwest after having been brought from Mexico. However, it was not adopted immediately. Their points had short widths and expanding stems with concave or straight bases. From 2000 to 500 BC, the climate began to get wetter. By the end of this period, the population density could be as high as one person per square mile. After the Armijo phase is the En Medio phase, lasting from 1500 BC to 1 CE. En Medio translates to in the middle. 
and that transition from hunter-gatherer to a more agricultural-based lifestyle begins to appear. From 1500 to 1000, maize and squash are planted in small plots, but this is not large-scale farming. It was believed to be mostly planted as a subsidy to the hunting and gathering lifestyle. If it grows where it planted, that just means extra food that year. Early pit rooms and storage pits begin to appear around this time. By about 500 BCE, beans, the last of the southwest agricultural triangle, had appeared. Not only do corn and squash not form complete proteins, they deplete the soil. Legumes like beans can form a complete protein and help with nitrogen fixing in the soil. By 500 BCE, farming could completely replace the hunting-gathering lifestyle. Some meat would still need to be collected for certain nutrients. It is also around this time that pit houses begin to appear. A pit house is a dwelling dug into the, abo- into the ground with a wooden roof that extends above it. The depth could vary depending on the region it was built in. On the website is a picture of a reconstructed pit house that was rebuilt in the 1960s at Mesa Verde. What are the advantages of a pit house? They're rather thermally efficient. In the winter or the summer, they remain about the same temperature, comparatively cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Right before 1 CE, the climate got a little wetter, allowing both foragers and farmers to farm more easily. The Chiricahua Cochise may have become the Mogollon or Hohokam people will encounter soon enough. However, not enough studies have been conducted to say for sure. After these periods, a transition occurred to the basket maker 1 or early basket maker phase. From here on out, adoption of these phases we'll be talking about for the prehistoric period is not uniform. Everyone didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to build a Pueblo One style house now. It was more of a gradual transition with different areas adopting things at different rates, depending on local factors. There were three major cultural groups in the Southwest by this time. The ancestral Puebloans in the Four Corners region, of which the majority of this podcast will be focused. The Mogollon in Southern New Mexico, which were extremely difficult to research for this show. And the Hohokam in Arizona, which will be the least talked about in this podcast. The basket maker periods can be divided into two periods, early basket maker and late basket maker. Sometimes these are also referred to as basket maker 1 or basket maker 2. Both of these are noted by more reliance on farming and the use of baskets with no pottery. Early basket maker lasted from about 1 CE to 400 CE. Between the start of basket of the basket makers and 300 CE, it is thought that the bow arrived in the Four Corners region. However, it was not distributed equally across New Mexico. For a hunter, what would be the advantages of switching to the bow? A simple answer would be that bows are just more accurate. Another is that they are better suited to the wooded environments that were being hunted in. Basket maker campsites tended to be in the uplands near streams and, or washes to have access to water. Near the end of this period, storage pits began to move into houses. This implies less sharing of resources within groups. Most likely, the early basket makers only lived in pit houses seasonally. To cook, it is thought that the basket maker people would heat up stones into the fire and then transport them to pools of water with baskets of food in them. Obviously, the basket would burn if put directly on the fire, so this would allow people to heat their food with little worry as the baskets were made tightly enough to keep water out. Late basket maker would see quite a few changes in lifestyle. While there were still hunter-gatherers in the mountains, the farming population continued to grow. Pottery began to appear with Sambrito brownware around 300 to 400 CE. Most likely, this brownware came from the Mogollon to the south, who had been making pottery for some time. The Mogollon may have even learned pottery from Mesoamerica. Another thing that may have been introduced by the Mogollon to the south are domesticated turkeys. Turkeys were rarely eaten until old, unless it was truly desperate times. Instead, they were used for their eggs and feathers. The former could be eaten, and the latter could be turned into clothing or ritual implements. Once once the turkey was killed, its bones could be used for tools. Late basket maker settlements tended to be in the uplands. They got more rain on average. However, the growing seasons were much shorter and fraught with peril, such as late freezes. As someone from the mountains of New Mexico, I can confirm. Our apricot tree rarely produced fruit due to the late freezes that hit every year. However, there is also more access to game and forage in the uplands, offsetting some of this risk. The type of farming is also quite important. Wet farming along waterways could be much more successful than dry farming, depending on the year. But there's a lot less land to wet farm in the southwest, meaning that not all groups had equal access to to such options. Corn cobs began to grow in size and pit houses became more standardized. Dried corn could be stored for the colder months and once stripped, the cob could be used to fuel the fire. Wild plants and game now subsidized the diet rather than being the primary source of food. There were more smaller villages during this time as well. By the 800s, there was less opportunity to return to the foraging and hunting strategy. Populations were becoming much more sedentary. However, there were still hunter-gatherers present. These changes in diet were not the only ones occurring. Socially, new changes were appearing. In the 600s and 700s, religious and social structures were changing. Community houses, early kivas, begin to appear, a circular building with a bench along one wall. Burials also begin to move closer to habitations, into middens or abandoned rooms or houses. Some of these grave goods, such as shells, could come from as far as 750 miles away in Texas or California. This is not to say life was easy. Grinding corn using sandstone manos and metates introduced tiny fragments of the rock that can wear down teeth. 
As there is extensive competition for game, the basket maker burials often show signs of osteoporosis due to a lack of amino acids from meat. Around 700 to 900 CE, another change would take place, the movement from below ground settlements to above ground ones. This period is known as Pueblo I. These above surface homes were often built next to pit houses, which could be used for storage. Villages also start to get larger. This could be due to the need for defense against those who did not have as, ex as successful years farming. Despite the above ground villages being built, they were not inhabited for very long, often abandoned after 30 to 40 years. Many reasons are speculated for this abandonment. In the late 700s, trade appears to have expanded, possibly due to more uncertainty in farming. The villages that had more successful years trading to those that had had less successful years, so that these villages would help when the situation reversed. It is also possible that this expansion of trade was to secure and reinforce alliances. This coincides with a period that was hot and dry, making rainfall harder to predict. Barring a few exceptions, those being Pueblo Bonito, Panasco Blanco, and Una Vida, farming outside of the uplands wasn't really viable. For those of you who have a little bit of an idea of what's coming next in the prehistoric era, some of those names, especially the first, should be rather familiar. Pueblo 1 is also one of the few periods that has heavy overlap with the one following it, Pueblo 2. However, you have to wait two episodes to hear about that. In the next episode, I want to move south and talk a bit about the Mogollon, now that they are beginning to play a larger part in our narrative. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends. Leave a review on your podcast app of choice if it lets you. Since I'm a Luddite and don't use social media, word of mouth and reviews are the only way the show spreads. We have a website located at engineeringfire.org, that's spelled E-N-G-I-N-E-E-R-I-N-G-F-I-R-E.org, where I have a link in the header for podcast resources, including pictures, companion posts, my bibliography, and the transcripts of each show. We have an email you can submit comments and questions to at michael at engineeringfire.org. The intro music is Desperados by Frank Schroeder and sourced from filmmusic.io. The outro music is Neo Western from Kevin McLeod of Incompetech. Links to all things mentioned are present in the show notes and at the website. Thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you in the next episode.